Well, through NDSU, we also have what's called the American Indian Public Health Resource Center. And we're working in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Health. And they have a statewide health improvement program. And uh, as part of that, there's also a tribal statewide health improvement program and tribal tobacco grants program. And our team at NDSU is working in collaboration with them uh, to do the evaluation of those programs. So this is wonderful. I, I know in Minnesota, there's always opportunities for improvements in state tribal relations, but you are light years ahead of South Dakota in terms of state tribal relations when it comes to programming. So the state legislature here in, in Minnesota actually funded uh, the statewide health improvement program, and there are 10 tribal SHIP programs and, and tobacco grants. And they wanted to address commercial tobacco use uh, and exposure, poor diet, and lack of regular physical activity. And it was a wonderful process in which the Minnesota Department of Health in 2013 did a statewide tribal engagement to identify priorities and worked with uh, the American Indian Cancer Foundation as a part of that process. I know we have some of their staff members here as well. So it was a really good formative process to ensure that there was adequate engagement at the front end and making sure that the programs that are adopted and modified to be culturally relevant are going to be most appropriate for the communities here. Just real briefly about our American Indian Public Health Resource Center at NDSC, we're focusing on four areas of public health education, services, policy, and research. And we've been able to now work with uh, every tribe in Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota in various uh, aspects of, of our technical assistance. And again, with um, Minnesota, it's predominantly through this uh, tribal ship program. So we take that four-pronged approach uh, with uh, public health policy, public health services, public health research, and public health education. And we're able to provide technical assistance to uh, tribes throughout the Northern Plains uh, in this arena. And what I had identified when I was working uh, in uh, the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board is that we didn't have access to teams of evaluators that are well-trained in evaluation but also understand the local cultures, or at least want to make the effort to understand the local cultures. And uh, very proud of our team. Uh, we have a couple of our team members here today. Dr. Melanie Nadu and Pearl Walker Sweeney are both here uh, with us today. In terms of tribal engagement, that really drives everything that we're doing. And it's one of the things that I think made the Minnesota uh, tribal ship program so successful was good tribal engagement at the front end. And I think this is going to be a model for other states to consider. So it's not just an opportunity to evaluate a program for community-specific outcomes. It also is a process in which we can evaluate, look at what's working and why, and replicate that hopefully in other states. So some of the goals to engage the ten, uh, 10 Minnesota tribes uh, in this program, there's actually 11 tribes, and um, one of the tribes uh, decided not to participate because they have a lot of their own resources, and that's this community here. So they've, they've been very generous with their resources here at Shakopee. But we're working with the other 10 tribes um, and, and engaging them around their ship and tobacco programs. And we're in the process now of assisting the grantees to identify data collection methods for their activities. And each community is different. Here in Minnesota, most of the tribes are under 638 contracts, so it's tribally operated programs, but not all of them. Actually, the three biggest tribes, Red Lake, White Earth, and Leech Lake, still have IHS direct services. So you can't take one approach to data collection because the access to the data uh, for IHS can be much more cumbersome. And then each tribe has to have their own data sharing agreements. Each tribe is its own sovereign nation. We have to be respectful of that. In terms of um, the framework, really to address this from a cultural values perspective, uh, and this is from the, the literature in indigenous evaluation, and it, to me it makes a lot of sense, recognizing that indigenous people are a people of a place. We come from somewhere. And when I was getting my Master of Public Health, I was fortunate to go to Harvard for my MPH, so I lived in Boston during that time frame. And a couple of my classmates were kind of trying to one-up each other about how long their families had been in the United States. And one, one person said, my family's been here for six generations. And the other guy said, well, my family's been here for seven generations. So my family's been here a thousand generations. 
This is our homeland. When we say Mother Earth, we mean it. The Earth is the dust of our ancestors. The Earth is the building blocks of future generations. We are people of a place. And that means a lot to us in many ways that isn't necessarily the same for other parts of this country. I don't know if place has the same deep-rooted spiritual and cultural value in other cities as compared to reservation or other tribal communities. We're also about community and family. And when I think about the challenges here, um, you know, we, we have a lot of healing ceremonies in which people talk about uh, what we're trying to do to promote health in a particular individual or a particular family. And I always have to recognize that when we're doing this, it's not always HIPAA compliant, right? Our traditional healers didn't operate in the world of HIPAA compliance, right? We were about each other. We were about community and family. And for those of us who participate in healing ceremonies, the power that you feel when you know your whole community wants you to be better is indescribable. We don't tap into that healing energy in modern times very well, but that can be a part of our framework of cultural values. And, and I, I loved what um, Abigail had said earlier about recognizing our gifts, the gifts that we have for others and the gifts that they bring to us as well, and that we recognize that each person is a valuable person. Each perspective is a valuable perspective, and the amount of respect that we hold for each other is, is very powerful from a traditional cultural perspective. And then, of course, tribal sovereignty. I like to say, if you've worked with one tribe, you've worked with one tribe. Each one is different, right? And we have to be respectful of that, and that what worked in one community may or may not work in another community. And as public health professionals, as we're developing and evaluating pro programs, it really is up to us to be respectful that um, we're not going to find one simple solution for all of our challenges. I'll end with this quote from Vine Deloria. Uh, this is about a people of a place. The vast majority of Indian tribal religions have a sacred center at a particular place, be it a river, a mountain, a plateau, valley, or other natural feature. This center enables the people to look out along the four dimensions and locate their lands, to relate all historical events within the confines of this particular land, and to accept responsibility for it. Regardless of what subsequently happens to the people, the sacred lands remain as permanent fixtures in their cultural and religious understanding. And in Lakota, we look to the Black Hills in South Dakota as a sacred place. And without getting into too much of the history and the controversy, the, the, the Lakota, great, the Great Sioux Reservation included the Black Hills until gold was discovered. Then the, the Black Hills were stolen. And this is well documented in legal history. And even the Supreme Court back in the 70s or 80s agreed that this was a breach of a treaty and they, they were gonna pay the tribes for this. And this fund is now in the hundreds of millions of dollars, but the tribes are saying, no, that land is not for sale. Could we use those resources to, to invest in public health? Sure. And I've had people in public health saying, why don't they just take the money and invest? But that would be contrary to who we are as a people. That land is not for sale, even if we could invest in healthy food as a result. And we, as public health professionals, need to be conscious of that and respectful of that. When uh, the tribes were first trying to explain that it was a sacred place, one of the cavalry members said, how could this be sacred? There's no buildings on it. Very different perspective in terms of what we consider sacred as indigenous people. And we have to be cognizant of that as we're building our programs and trying to implement things in a meaningful way. I think I'll go ahead and stop there to, in the interest of time and ask Abigail to come back up. But thank you all very much.